Hey, everybody. Hello, hello. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. And I'm rejoicing and I'm being glad in it. And I know everybody else is as well. So we're going to get rock and rolling this morning. And I want to thank you and welcome you onto this time together and give you a little bit of an idea what we're going to be talking about. So part of this conversation this morning is going to be about visions and dreams and the importance of having a vision and the importance and significance of pursuing dreams in your life and wanting those of you to know regardless whether you're in Mary Kay or not involved in our company my intention and the prayer in my heart is that I'll be able to say something instill something cause a new consideration allow you to ponder bring a new a new processing to the forefront um, and just really just ignite your heart and your spirit a little bit in this in these moments. So I absolutely have to recognize the fact that this is a Saturday in between our Good Friday and our Easter Sunday. And of course, did not even think about that when I originally <laughs> scheduled this, but I'm so grateful for that because I feel as if um, of all the things that we've been going through and all the uncertainty that is happening in the world right now and in our lives, and the fact that we're not knowing exactly what's in front of us, and we're not even knowing when we wake up exactly what it is that we're going to be negotiating <laughs> or navigating through as the day goes on, that I believe it's required. It's required us to have a deeper sense in our faith. It's required us to get an internal rooting. It's required us to really go to him and ask for that peace of mind that surpasses all understanding and for us to be comforted and blanketed in that. And so what I'm going to be talking about is the importance of having something that you're looking forward to in the future. So, so here's the celebration. The purpose and the intention of a vision is knowing, number one, you guys, knowing that when you were born, this is my, these are my foundational principles of my understanding and really what anchors me is that when you were born, of course, um, God has told us. <laughs> and in Jeremiah, he says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I knew you and I consecrated you. I set you apart and infused into you. So knowing that, number one, you were born for a purpose, you're born for a purpose, and that there is a plan for your life. And that plan for your life is a plan of great success, and it is a plan of victory. It is the awareness that you're not trying to go after success, and you're not trying to find the victory that you are operating out of that because it's already been equipped within you. You are equipped with your talents and your abilities and your giftedness. And and with that first and foremost comment, um, your talents, of course, are different. They're different than your sister's talents, and they're different than your mom's talents, and they're different from your bestie bestesses talents, and they're different from your children's talents. And it's learning to embrace who you are, what makes you special. And then discovering how it is that you are to lead your life out of your gifting and your talents. Because your purpose and the intention for your life is absolutely connected to those talents. And when we understand that there is a plan, I think that allows us to just take that deep breath and know that he's got us. And that as we move forward in that plan, that with the intention being for success, that is an absolute, an absolute. Even though there are scary things happening right now, the absolute is that there is a future and there is a hope, a future and a hope. So the number one is knowing that you're created for a purpose. There is a plan for your life. You do have talents gifted gifts and intentions. And then we're going to break down why it's so important to have a vision. Um, the scripture, of course, is Proverbs 29, 18, and that is with no vision, people perish. 
And the reason that I set that scripture to be part of what we talk about today is because um, without something that we're excited about, without that hope that we put in front of ourselves, without that knowing that um, there is there are greater times ahead of us, it's going to get better and better and better and better. And my life is going to be glory to glory to glory to glory. Does not mean that there's going to be an absence of difficulties or discouragements or challenges. There's not going to be an absence of even crisis which obviously we're in the midst of right now. That's not that's not the scenario, but the scenario is that as we are walking through that, we are not by ourselves. And the scripture that I grabbed for that was um, Isaiah 43, 2, which is when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned up. It will not consume you because you are not alone. So with that being said, um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Stacey James, and I am a national sales director with Mary Kay Incorporated. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my life and the things that I've learned because the vision and dreams and direction have had everything to do with my journey and my life's work. Um, when I first started with this magnificent company, I was teaching school and I have, and I love teaching school. In fact, um, I, there is this thing, this thing that, um, that you deserve to be paid what you're worth, not necessarily what the job is worth. And I have learned to absolutely disagree with that statement. And the reason why is because I believe the position of a school teacher is worth a whole lot. <laughs> I believe it is a deeply abiding, highly significant role that you play in children's lives and of course the people that you teach. My challenge is that that's what I wanted. I wanted to make an impact and I wanted to make a difference. In fact, Mary Kay always says that what she believes about all women is that um, we want to believe in ourselves. We want to lead, uh, we want to, we, we need to discover the potential that God has birthed in us. We want to lead a meaningful life and we want to love our life. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted that meaningful life and I wanted to make that impact. The situation we're in, however, is that we, I was tolerating the income that was coming into my life. And when I say by tolerating is that I was, my imagination, your imagination is really what is connected to your vision. It is the ability to see something that isn't currently the case and actually pray for clarity of vision, that the vision for your life has to do with something that is beyond your your current situation into a place that is unlike what your circumstances look like now. The desire of your heart, a dream are all the things that you run after on the way to living out your vision. And your dreams are those things that are the goals that you set in front of you right now that are your pursuit. They are your pursuit of progress. And even though I love my teaching position, my husband, Brian, was in college full time at that point in time. He was in pre-med and our daughter, Jennifer, was in kinder care. We lived in a two bedroom apartment that had gross yellow carpeting. And I grew up in an upper middle class family with a beautiful home and lots of toys. <laughs> we lived on a lake, we had boats, we had jet skis, we had snowmobiles. And I knew what it was like to live in an abundant situation and be able to have the lifestyle that we had because my dad was a dreamer. And when you are a dreamer, you you bring your family into that because there's no way that your family cannot be included when you have a heart for a dream. Because when you're living for a dream, you are ignited and you're excited and there's adrenaline that goes on inside of you as a result of believing that the dream can become a reality. And my dad, since he was a dreamer, 
before we lived on that lake, we purchased the lot. We purchased the lot and on Sundays we would go get donuts and we would sit on the lot and we would have our breakfast on Sunday and we would, and he would talk about this is what the house is going to look like that we're going to build on this lot. This is the view that's going to be uh, from our living room, dining room, master bedroom. And, and he would include us in that visualization and in that dream and in that reality. And as children, we didn't, my sister and I did not doubt it for a moment. It didn't ever occur to us that that wouldn't happen because we were buying into our dad's ignited, excited heart. And that's the benefit of having that dream in front of you. So in the situation that I was in, when we were living in the two bedroom apartment with the bad carpeting <laughs> is that we also had a lot of debt. Ryan brought debt into the marriage. I brought debt into the marriage. And at that point in time, we had not been married for very long. had an instant family when we got married and we were just navigating. And when you're navigating, you're tolerating. And sometimes you don't know anything else except to tolerate because that's the best that you can do at the moment. And even though I was not excited about those that environment, that one car that we had that was breaking down, had a hole in the floorboard that was not dependable, um, the, I was, I've always been a happy person. So it didn't affect my happiness or my joy, um, but it did affect my drive and my hope because when I considered how we wanted our life to look, there was nothing about our life that, that looked like that picture. And it was going to be a long time before we were able to live the way we wanted to because it was going to be a long time before Brian continued on and finished up his education. So the dreams were on the back burner. And I know what it feels like to live with dreams on the back burner. And I know what it feels like to be running after a dream. So I was contained, even though here's the contained because my principle, no matter how much value he saw in my teaching because I was highly dedicated because I, I did the and then some, I gave extra hours. I was passionate about what I was doing. I was inspired to teach the kids and that made me worth a lot. I believe I was worth a lot, but he couldn't pay me what I was worth because it was, he was not allowed to pay me. He was only allowed to pay me what, and the superintendent was only allowed to pay me what the container, the limitation of that position was offering. So it really didn't matter how great my skills were. That did not make a dent in what my income potential was at that moment. I was working on my master's degree on the side just a little bit um, because that's all I had a little bit. Of, but the money I was putting in my master's degree, I wasn't going to get that money out of that master's degree for a very long time. So it was also that interesting little dance that you're doing. So here's what happens when there's a major change in your life. There's a major disruption that occurs. And for me, the major disruption at that moment is that our car broke down. For all of us right now, we're in a major disruption. And so that's why I felt that this message could be timely for everyone concerned, because when you're in a disruption, it causes you to consider your life differently. Or sometimes it gives you a, a filter that shifts or that everything that you knew to be so, like Joe Dispenza always says that, is your life defined by a future vision or is it, is it defined by the information of your past? Like, are we operating out of disappointments or challenges, discouragements, or an identity that was not serving us? Or maybe we were working out of obligation just to get a paycheck, not working out of a passion for something that we loved. And as a result of that, you find yourself um, in a scenario that's been a disruption and with everything altered to reconsider, 
reconsider that maybe there's a different design and that a future vision is not something that you walk into. It's something that you create. I believe that it's something that God has for us, but the creation is that he gives us the inspiration of our heart, the desires of our heart, the talents and the gifts that align with that. So then that creativity and that imagination is what allows us to create what has already been planned out. We get to create because that even though it's planned out for us, we can choose to walk in a different place. We can choose not to seek him. We can choose not to listen to the leadings. We can choose to just work out of and navigate the container that we're currently in and life is living us instead of us living our life. And we start to tolerate the scenarios instead of choosing to elevate ourselves above the scenarios to a whole different lifestyle future that we want to manifest because we do manifest it with our thoughts, our belief and our faith. So what happened in that situation is that car broke down, did not have the money to fix the car and did not have the car. And since we had only one car that affected everything. So had to borrow money from my parents to get the car fixed. But that was the thing that caused me to draw the line in the sand and say, something has got to change. Like, this is changing. I'm not going to put up with this any longer in my life because this is not how we're supposed to be living. I've been created for more than this, than just staying in this limiting environment. So, so my prayer was at that moment, and I don't even know if it was a prayer, was that I don't know what's going to change, but something's going to change. So this is what I do know about how God has operated in my life and what he's done for me is that anytime I've had a, a, a disruption where I've sought him and said, show me, reveal to me, I believe he's always revealing it to us. It's just that sometimes we are not looking for it or we're not expecting it or we're not being sensitive to it. And so all of a sudden I was expecting it and he brought it. He brought me a person who introduced me to this amazing company and this opportunity. And as a result of me saying yes. So then here's the other thing. Saying yes to something is a positive step in a powerful direction to make a change. <laughs> a positive step in a powerful direction to make a change. Now that's what you say yes to. We don't say yes to things that are going to take us down. We don't say yes to things where there are going to be people involved who are not going to believe in us, who are, who are going to discourage us, who are going to make life more difficult for us. We say yes to the things that are positive and powerful, and we can observe the positive and the powerful. Now, when Mary Kay created this company, um, I'm going to tell, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later because the design of this is that I'm going to be talking about the vision and the future and the dreams. And then at the end of my time of doing that, which will be about 1030, um, then I will go into a little bit more about our company. But at that point in time, you can make the decision whether you want to stay on and listen to more about the company or if you want to simply take advantage of of this message that I have for you right now, because it's, it's intended to be a blessing of a message, regardless, of course, of your affiliation with us. If you are a friend that's been invited on, you're an entrepreneur that's been invited on, if you're a family member that's been invited on, I want you to hear a good word. So what happened is um, I made the decision um, because there was something that she said to me that penetrated my heart. So this story is because there are things that other people will say that don't affect us. And then there will be something someone says that absolutely pierces our soul. And that was kind of what happened. She told me about the company, but then she said, really the most significant part of this is understanding the philosophy of, of how, why this company resides, why Mary Kay started this company in the first place. It was for the sake of women, not for the sake of a company. And she believes that um, if you put women in an environment that is supportive and encouraging, and there are people there who believe in you, see the best in you, look for the best in you, seek out the best in you. Like one of the things she would say is if you see a woman as she can be, like you treat women not according to their current performance, you treat them according to their potential performance, according to their potential. So that 
we often will rise to how we're treated. If we're treated as valuable and worthy and smart and brilliant and incredible, then we will start to see ourselves differently. If we're treated in a diminished capacity, then sometimes we buy into that. Um, it's the same kind of thing as that sometimes if we say a lie, but we say it over and over and over again, we'll begin to believe the lie, even though it, it's a lie. It's not a truth. And someone can believe a lie about us and we can absolutely start to function in their belief about us that is detrimental because we're seeing ourselves through someone who's diminishing us or we can have someone in front of us who can cast a greater vision that might not seem the reality of who we currently are, but it's connected to our potential. And then as a result of that, it will light up something inside of you. There's no way that it can't. It just absolutely does. So, <laughs> so as a result, she said to me that this woman created this company for the sake of women. That shook my heart because I, that's why I love teaching children for the sake of the children. I wanted to teach school for the sake of the children, for what I was going to do for the sake of them. I didn't want to teach school because I got summers off. <laughs> I didn't want to teach school before because it's a shorter work day. That was not my motivation. My motivation was because I wanted to do it for the sake of the kids. I wanted to make a meaningful difference. So when she said that, caused my heart to stir. Then she said that Mary Kay Ash um, created the company on biblical principles, putting God first, family second, and career third. And she said in that order, everything works for women. Out of that order, we find ourselves actually starting to suffocate. Like you start to not be able to have the oxygen when you're trying to, when you're not able to operate within that order. So sacrificing, sacrificing things that are of the utmost significance to us in our lives. So the other thing that she said that caused me to say yes to this, the yes to the positive progressive step <laughs> was she said that Mary Kay Ash did not believe in constructive criticism. Now, I know that that's like a really, sometimes a really crazy comment for someone to say because, every, you know, there is absolutely a, a, a facet um, of constructive criticism that people feel is constructive. But this is what she said to me. And I, I agreed with it with all my heart because she said, being constructive, you can guide someone, you can redirect someone. You can help them alter behaviors. And you can do that without being critical or criticizing them. And that's why it's, criticism is not constructive. It is destructive. And I believed it was destructive because I, I worked with children. When you criticize a small child, they dig their heels in. When you criticize an adult, they dig their heels in and they get defensive. It's just a human response to it. And so if you want to help lead someone out of something or into a better place, criticism is not the way to do that. And she believed in helping women see the potential within themselves and celebrate them so that they would discover it within themselves, give them a safe environment in which they're not worried about messing up or saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing because they're loved unconditionally. And as a result, they're going to thrive as th because of it. I believe that if you're in a boardroom and you're throwing ideas out onto a boardroom table and some, and you know that what you're in store for is people who start to take you down. Like if this was such a good idea, then she would have thought of that or somebody else would have thought of that and have you thought of this and this is why this isn't going to work and it gets all chopped up and then after a while you stop throwing good ideas out on the boardroom table because you know that your message is getting lost in the takedown versus in our business which is a very interesting environment interesting because I'm going to just, just inject this little story right here. Um, when I went to my very first meeting, my very first success meeting in Mary Kay, um, I was already a consultant. I'd already signed up. I became a consultant. I even became a consultant before I tried the product line. And I went to the success meeting and I walked in and I was challenged. 
<laughs> I came home. My husband was waiting for me at the door and he said, so how was it? And I said, O'Brien, oh, like those women are weird. They're weird. And he said, oh. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Because we had to, you had to work two weekends to come up with your $85 for your starter kit. That's how much my starter kit was in 1981. Now it's only a hundred. Back then it was eighty-five dollars. Um, you had to wait. I had to waitress for two weekends. Two weekends. Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night for two weekends in order to come up with the eighty-five dollars. And now the women are weird. And I said, "Well, they are. They are happy, <laughs> extraordinarily happy. And they smile and they hug each other. And um, somebody sneezes in the group and they break out in applause." <laughs> And someone walks away from the group and they say nice things about her like this is foreign to me. So um, what I realized, what I realized is that you become like the people you surround yourself with. And when I was teaching school and we would go in the break room, we were not hugging each other. There was not a lot of smiling going on. In fact, the majority of the conversation was complaining, complaining about the kids, complaining about the principal, complaining about the parents. And if one teacher would get up and walk out, we would complain about her. Now, here's the hard part. This is what's scary about this is that I grew up in a very positive future focused things. We didn't talk about other people and around the dinner table. And so that was not our conversations. I didn't grow up with that. But all of a sudden, I got immersed in that environment. And I started becoming just like them. And so when I went into this new environment, it was so foreign to me. And then it scared me that it made me uncomfortable being around happy people who were not giddy, goofy, happy. They were joyously happy. There's a difference, except when you're not used to it. You don't always discern there's a difference. The difference is um, happiness is a choice. It doesn't, it's not affected by things that are going on in your life um, because outside things causing you to be affected. Like I think Joe Dispenza always says that people live their life waiting for something on the outside to change so that they are more grateful or something to get another job that pays them more so that they're more abundant or something external happens. So the internal changes when actually we're responsible for changing the internal first. And that's what changes the external. You become happy first. You have a vision first. You run after a dream first. So my, when I, um, well, I started, I kept going back to those meetings and I became just like them. <laughs> make other people's deadness more apparent sometimes as well. <laughs> so I did tone it down a little bit when I was at school, but I was excited because I started doing this business had a dream that I was running after. Okay. So to make sure that we've got all of our points about vision and dream, this is the importance. When you have a, a vision, a vision is what creates your life to get a little bit more narrow, meaning Okay, I know another little story, but it's going to pull right into this. Um, I just read the other day because I was reading about um, 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 uh, the statue of David, um, and I was reading about I was going to I was reading about Michelangelo and how he for two years carved out the statue of David that's in Florence, Italy, which I've been grateful that Brian and I were able to see while we were in Florence. So. Um, there were two other sculptures, sculptors, <laughs> not sculptors, who were commissioned prior to him taking on that assignment. And both of them backed out of it. Um, they started it, but they backed out of it. One of them said that the marble was too flawed. Um, they didn't even know why the other person backed out. So he was commissioned. And when he stepped up and he went after it, um, he was asked. Why is it that you chose to do it when two others had said no or backed away? And he said, because when I stood and looked at that large piece of marble, I saw David. I saw David inside. And how I 
sculpted David is I chipped away everything that wasn't him. And I ended up with him, which is, I believe, what God is doing. He's chipping away everything that is not of us. And he is bringing to the light us in our talents, in our gloriousness. So a vision clarifies the you. A vision gives you the channel that you run upon. So as you do so, you know what to not do. You associate with people who who join you in your vision. Your vision affects other people because you're inspired by it. You have a direction and a purpose for your life. So you say you take better care of yourself as a result of that. You will read things that feed your brain and your heart and your soul and ignite you. Conversations that do the same. So I'm going to read you this little definition because I think it correlates right with this. Um, I had written down five points one time as to why I believed in um, moving forward, making progress, the pursuit of progress that transforms your life. Um, And these are the things I wrote down. So you can kind of reflect back over what I've said. I believe that looking for and recognizing the best in other people is truly what blesses your life doesn't bless our lives to look for what we don't like about others, but it does bless our life to look for the good and the potential and to see the person that they can be and then help them to see that person. Um, Mary Kay used to say that most women will only advance to the level of success that the most significant person in their life believes that they will. And then she would go on to say to us, It's not that you become more significant than that woman's husband or children. Of course, that's never our intention. But we, but here's the deal. Sometimes you become the most significant person as far as believing in them. And if you believe that they can achieve and accomplish far more than they're even considered, they will raise their standard or their consideration, which I believe reveals their vision and also ignites their dreams, ignites their dreams, because we all have dreams. It's planted inside of us. We just need to realign ourselves or reignite ourselves or even uncover what those are. Being in a positive atmosphere around people who do just that, who recognize the good in you, will help you to do that very thing. I believe that women are brilliant and have been created in God's genius. Number two, I believe that unhappiness and restlessness can be caused by a lack of goals and a lack of progress in a person's life. If we're not achieving, if we're not getting the rush, if we're not going after something, and it's not going after something at all cost, it's going after something as part of the venue of your life because you're supposed to. You're supposed to reveal the glorious testimony that God has positioned inside of you. Faith is the substance of what is hoped for. Faith is unreasonable. And faith is illogical. It is the evidence of what is not seen. Dreams are supposed to be unreasonable. And they're not supposed to be logical. Vision is not necessarily understood by anybody else but you. But people will be affected by your vision. God has etched his vision on your heart for you to understand. As you understand, it will make the greatest impact. It narrows the playing field because you have preciseness, direction, And then you can eliminate unnecessary, unnecessary distractions. Our children are not, (laughs) they are not unnecessary distractions. They are necessary distractions. You eliminate unnecessary distractions. Oftentimes distractions that we bring into our own lives that are just taking our time or sucking our energy that are not keeping us on the path of the vision and the dream. So three, I believe that when women are placed into a supportive, loving, energized atmosphere, 
that they begin to think a new thought, see themselves differently, operate in a new kind of hope. Four, I believe that leading a prosperous and abundant life is possible when you have the right kind of opportunity and environment to be saturated in. And five, success does not happen because of ideal circumstances usually happens in spite of ideal circumstances. Success occurs when someone has the courage to change their circumstances. My dad used to say, if you keep doing what you're currently doing, you're going to keep getting what you're currently getting. And a distraction or a disruption changes what we've currently been doing. In fact, if something needs to change, then something needs to change. So the deal is with this pulling this all together. And everything we do, it positions us, prepares us, and marks us for where that plan is to take us. We are gathering from all the scenarios and all the learning, experiential especially, to take it into our toolbox. So as we move forward, we have the necessary equipping that will be called upon. There is a story um, about a doctor. And I was going to look to see, because oh, where did I put his name? George, it'll come to me. George, uh, Grinaldi, I think was it. Okay, I'll go back and look. But okay, he was commissioned to go to Calcutta, and he was a, he was an infectious disease doctor, and he was to save. Um, Mother Teresa's life, actually, he was brought there to do so. And this was in the 80s. Um, through all the things that he um, did to help her, um, ultimately, when it came right down to saving her life, it was that he had to get an IV into her veins that were collapsing and no one could do that. And the reason he could do that is because when he first got out of med school, he worked in, in really difficult environments um, in New York City where he would put IVs into the veins of addicted drug users whose veins had collapsed. The skill he learned back then was the skill he needed years later to save Mother Teresa's life. The things we are learning right now are the things we're going to call on and need in the future when we're positioned to make a big impact a difference, a turn, save a life, enhance a life, accelerate a life, elevate a life, help a woman to believe in herself. One woman who believes in herself can affect so many other people's lives and it also changes generations. So in this time, you guys, where we are in the midst of the uncertainty, when we are operating out of somewhat the fear of not knowing, when Everything in our home has changed and been altered. The perfect pause in this moment is that yesterday was Good Friday. On Friday, when Christ was crucified, when all hope was dashed, when the world went dark, when his only begotten son died on the cross. Everyone thought that it had failed, that he was gone. The curtain was drawn. And yet, the best part, it was Friday. Sunday was coming. And right now we're in Saturday. And Sunday is coming. And even though 
We don't even always know what our dream and our vision is. I believe he'll reveal it to you. I believe you just need to pray about it. It takes action, it takes courage, it takes direction, it takes change, it takes a shift. But what it is, is leading a life of glorious anticipation, excitement, and exhilaration. You become passionate. And then the courage comes as a result of that. And it fuels your desire to continue to make progress. So the promise is the best part of you is connected to your vision. The best part of you is connected to your dream. The best part of you exists because God created you for it. And the Sunday that's coming is happening tomorrow. So with that being said, I would just love to invite you guys all to stay on because I'm just going to go over a little bit of an understanding and an idea about our Mary Kay company. Um, but if you're done right here, that's totally fine. Uh, my prayer is that you are taking something good away from our time together. But if you've ever wondered how it is that the women in our company actually do make money, <laughs> if you've wondered how it is that um, they, not, they not only can walk into an environment that allows them to make instant in ca cash right at hand, but then also can absolutely be, um, <laughs> can, can go into the throes of elevation that can go into the millions that you can take that $85 starter kit and actually do make millions of dollars with it. How it is that those women earn free cars. Um, this is going to be a little bit of an information session on that. And it's not going to take very long, but I do just want to give it some, some, consideration because it is so very unique. So here's the deal. I believe that an entrepreneurial mindset is not a traditional mindset. I know that when I came into Mary Kay, that was not the norm of how women thought. And it was not the norm actually really of how men thought because we were operating back then all those years ago in a very traditional situation. An entrepreneurial mindset is for the intention that you do not Stay within the confines or the limitations of someone else's income for you that you can take your greatest giftings and talents and you can pursue and create the life of your dreams or life that you want. You design it and it is there for you to do so. So what's so different about our marketing plan? It's called a dual marketing plan. And the reason why that is so unique is because it is unlike, say unlike, unlike. It is not like, it is not common. It is not like any other marketing plan that exists. Why doesn't it? Why wouldn't someone copy our marketing plan since we've been going for 56 years? And in that 56 years, we have, we are in 39 other countries and we are a debt-free company. And, and why would they not copy that? The reason why is because there are some things about our company that other companies would not necessarily be willing to do or sometimes to start from the ground up right now with our culture might be a little bit more challenging. I'm not sure, but here's what's interesting about how we operate. Our company was not created, our marketing plan was not created to allow us to make extra money. Our company, our marketing plan was created to, to set us into a plan and a motion that would encourage us to be able to and then have it available to us so that we absolutely would make extra money. Not the thought that it would be nice if we could, but that we absolutely would. We absolutely would. So in my situation, when I started and we were so far in debt, I did three parties every weekend. You can, and there are no quotas, so you can do a little bit. Or you can do a lot, but in my situation, I was going to do one party. It ended up, I was like, if I could do one, I could do three. I did three, and then I was making more income on my one day that I was doing my three parties than I was making teaching school all week long. So then all of a sudden, there's a new thought that, you know, like hits you out of left field. And that is that you can make more money in less time and you're the person profiting from it so that you are building your own business. You are the owner of your own company 
company. So in my situation, well, since here's how the commission structure works, it's a 50% commission structure. So if I take you back to Mary Kay Ash and why she started the company, she did not have a product that she thought would be great to market and then thought, I'm going to start this company and put together this marketing plan. I'm going to find people who want to sell this and then they'd make money if they want to sell it. And then my business, well, flourished and grow and become successful because I'm going to have all these other people out there selling this product. That's not the way our company happened. And that's never been the intention of our company. Our company happened because Mary Kay Ash wanted to create something for the sake of women to be successful, financially independent. But this is what she really, I mean, here's the part that's so magnificent is she knew for sure. She knew for sure that women could look at the greatest marketing plan on the face of the earth at that point in time. And I still believe today. And oftentimes we'll say, I think she could be great at this. I can see the potential in this and I think she would be great at this because she is confident or she is an extrovert or she's great at sales or she's, I mean, we come up with all these reasons and then we say, but I don't think that I could be good at this, but I think she could be great at this, but I don't think I could be good at this. So her intention was to create an environment and an atmosphere of that encouragement and that support so that women could learn to believe in themselves and then pull their talents to the forefront and discover their potential and how amazing they truly are. And then those of us in the company, we buy into that, of course, because that is what we entered into. It is the culture and the atmosphere of our company. It is believing in the potential of other women, that we want them to believe in themselves themselves. We believe in them until they do. And then when they do believe in themselves, we applaud them and we celebrate them. And we're excited about every achievement that they make. This gave me my path. My path was that I had this marketing plan where I could make 50%. Um, the product was not something she started with. She started with a marketing plan. And then she had, she elected, selected nine women that she knew that she knew or knew of. And those women thought like she thought. They had a similar mindset to her, similar work ethic to her. And, um, and because of that, because mentality is everything. Everything. It's what we filter the things that happen to us through. It is how we view the world. We either believe the world is there to support us or we believe the world is there to take us down. We believe we have to struggle and fight for any to make any way or get any movement in or to get recognized or you believe that God is going to elevate you with his favor when we operate in believing in our future. So in our mind, if we wake up and we our, our vision is defined by our future versus the, the thought process of our past, what are we creating in our of our reality of who we are do we see ourselves as conquerors do we see ourselves as strong do we see ourselves as unwavering do we see ourselves as courageous how do we see ourselves or do we see ourselves as diminished do we see ourselves as not as smart as do we see ourselves as as less than because in order to shift that to be the powerful women we are we got to be around the people who believe the same and she did that. She created that for us. But she started that with the first nine women. They joined her. They joined her in this pursuit, this movement, this momentum, this mission to help women discover their greatest self and to have a company or a business where they could have financial independence. And so as a result of that, they went into like, well, what are we going to sell? <laughs> <laughs> and she chose the skincare line simply because um, she had used it um, for quite a while and had beautiful skin as a result of it. And it was from a hide tanner who had originally created the products. She bought the prescription from the hide tanner's granddaughter and they went into manufacturing and they marketed that product. Now that's the start of our skincare line and our skincare product 56 years ago. And from that point on, we have become a state of the art. You know, in today's world, you cannot have an okay product or an average product. You need to have an extraordinary product product to market. No matter how great your marketing plan is, you have to have an extraordinary product because that is the 
additional blessing to other women. Um, so what is remarkable about right now is two years ago, our company invested in debt-free, even with the investment of our brand new manufacturing facility, a hundred million dollar manufacturing facility in Texas. Um, the intention of that manufacturing facility is not only for global manufacturing, um, but in addition to that, um, we set up, we have laboratories. We have a new, um, dermat we have a new scientist that was hired a few years Years ago, her name is Dr. Lucy Gilday, and Dr. Gilday hired 10 other scientists that specialize in other areas. Um, we have scientists and laboratories in our new manufacturing facility that one is created to take the product we currently have right now that is extraordinary and any areas or places that need to be ramped up, they are working on if, the, if it does or not or should be ramped up. And usually it's done with supplements, new supplements that come on board. Um, and then in addition, um, we have laboratories that are creating, inventing things that are not even heard of of yet. It's not like something else that's out there and we create something better. It's creating the forerunners of new things that have not even been marketed yet. So our goal is that we're going to be the number one skincare company in the world. That is our goal. Absolutely. That is our vision. Our vision excites other people to come along with us because it is exact, it is deliberate, and we are going to do that. We are absolutely going to do that. And we have positioned all these things. Well, then, as, as would have it, this virus hit globally, pandemic, biblical proportions. And our company, because of our new manufacturing facility, had the ability to be able to make hand sanitizers. And as a result of that, um, we took all the ingredients, FDA approval that went through really quickly, and now we are donating hand sanitizers through um, Baylor White, through 50 different hospitals in Texas and beyond, and to the front lines, donating. We are manufacturing, creating, and donating. And as a result of that also, we are flourishing. So not only is our company doing all that is right, we're not selling them as of yet, because everything that we create is being donated. Um, but as far as our business goes, Hallelujah. Our consultants and our directors in our company are flourishing during this time where there's so much uncertainty for so many people um, because there is not only a market, but now we have the virtual community. So because of um, being able to provide education online, because we don't just sell a product, we educate about a product, what it does, how it does it. And as a result of that, um, women benefit from not just using the product, but understanding what it does and how it works. And then, and then also you have a consultant because we're about relationships. We're not about pushing something. We're about building relationships and providing that connection. So virtually, even though we're selling lots of products virtually right now and our consultants are flourishing, um, the benefit is that the relationships are still being built, still being built, still being built because that is who we are. We can't operate any differently. That's what we're grounded on. That's what we're founded on. So 50%, if it were a company where they just wanted women to be able to make some money, she could have offered us 20% or 30%, but no, she provided 50% commission when we sell the product. But in addition to that, we do have commissions that we make when we build a team and those commissions come from the company to pay you. So you have Sally on your team. When Sally orders product to sell and make money, then she orders more product and she sells it and makes money, more orders more product. When that happens, then since you sponsored her, you get a commission that comes from the company, not off of Sally, not a cut in Sally. We don't make money off of anyone, but we make money because of them. So we make our 50% and then we have commissions that we make. 4% commissions because of women on our team that go into um, that go into 9% commissions that go into 13% commissions that have lots of bonuses that come alongside. So now we're making more of that 
50% commission because we're now we're cutting into the other 50% where the company profits. There, Mary Kay is giving us more of that in the form of team building, streams of income. So in addition to me making those <laughs> making that, that income from my sales, I started building a team right away. And as I started building a team, um, then I had that additional income coming in from that. And then I made that decision that I was going to leave my teaching position and I was going to pursue this. I, I supported my family. I supported my family with the sale of the product, being a consultant, doing that. And then, of course, my goal and my dream was to become a director on the way to serving that vision. My goal and my dream. So my dream was to become a director. I needed to build that team of women. I'm a leader by heart, by nature. And I could not wait to be in that place that I could teach other women how to build their businesses so that they could make the income and succeed past that. Um, so the glorious things that happened is my first year, my income was about 30000 as a consultant building my business. My teaching income was 11000 So going... <laughs> From 11,000 a year to 30,000 as I walked into this company 38 years ago um, was like mind blowing to my husband and myself. And then my next year I was the director, it went up to 50,000 and then it went up to 70,000 and then it went up to 100,000 and it's continued to go up from there. Um, when my husband, when we moved to Lincoln, Nebraska and he started to work for the state, um, he made a decision at one point in time where there were some things that weren't quite going right there. He was having to work within the limitations of the department that he was at. Um, and he came home one day and he said, I'm going to quit my job. And I said, okay. <laughs> so what are you going to do? And he said, well, I've been thinking about that on my drive home today. I think that I'm now going to work with you and help you with your business. And so I said, so, so what are you going to do? And he said, I don't know either, but we can figure it out because we always figure it out. And he was right. So he went into his boss's office and he resigned from his position. Um, and that was, I had been a director for five years at that point. I was over the $100,000 mark. He said, we don't need my income. Mary Kay is our future. And I don't need to be dealing with some of those things that are going on. It's not necessary. If we were working together, then I could be helping you more. And that would help our future and our vision. Um, and of course, we not only had our daughter, Jennifer, but then Whitney was one years old when Brian made the decision to do that. It was this month. It was April. It was April. So 34 years ago. <laughs> this month and then so he went into his boss's office he told him he was going to give his, his two weeks his resignation and his boss was a doctor and said to, to Brian so how does it make you feel that your wife not only makes more money than you do but now she always will and my husband I love I always say I just I think secure men are so sexy <laughs> <laughs> so my husband, Brian, said, well, actually, it makes me feel pretty good. But I'd like to know how it makes you feel because she makes way more money than you do, too. <laughs> and so with that, um, we joined forces. Um, and here's what's really interesting is that a few months later, actually, it was six months later, the CDC in Atlanta um, flew him into Atlanta because they'd heard about the work that he'd done the grants he had written and his reputation preceded him and his other position. And so they wanted to offer him a job. So he flew to Atlanta. And of course I'm thinking, I don't want to move to Atlanta. And uh, at that point we were living in Lincoln, Nebraska and he um, came home from that. He was there for a few days, went from interview to interview, finding all about the position and would have been a feather in his cap for sure. And when he came home and sat down in front of me, he said, I, I decided not to take the job. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> okay, so why? And he said, well, he goes, because this is what's happened to me in the last six months. It's restored my faith in human nature. Because I've been working with you and all the women in your 
unit and your offspring sales directors and they have goals and they have dreams and they're running after them just as we are. And you're opening up the doors so they can do that. And I'm watching the impact and I'm seeing their hearts and their souls and, and their love for each other and their desire to help each other and give to each other and pick each other up and, and, and see the greatness that's in because that is what it's all about. I, I just cannot allow myself to go back into an environment that is negative and, and, and diminishing and will suck the life out of me because this is too valuable. This environment is too valuable. It is a gift in itself. So as you build your business and you build that team and you become a director, then the commission structure changes dramatically as well. We say that women who are doing that time make you know, anywhere from 5000 to 25000 a year part-time just depends on how much you want to work. There's no goal. There's no quotas. And you have no limitations. And you're your own boss. You have all the help. You're never in business by yourself, for yourself, but not by yourself. And you have all of this engagement. So, but then directors um, who are working their businesses as a career, 5000 to 25000 a month. A month. That's a huge difference. Um, and then national sales directors, which is what my position is, is that you have helped develop other women who want to be directors. You work with them differently than you work with all of the consultants in your unit. And the reason why you do is because they need more of you, because they're advancing in the area of building a team and being a leader. And then you work with them on communication skills and leadership skills and um, how to how to um, infuse that inspiration and then how to create an environment that people can learn. And, you know, knowledge is one thing. Teaching it so others understand is a, a different thing. And, and so teaching women how to do that very thing, be the ultimate teachers and coaches and life coaches. And then, so as national sales directors, then you work with directors. So with all the directors, you're a leader leading leaders. And that's the position of a national sales director income on, you know, on <laughs> from 300,000 on up to our highest paid women maybe over a million dollars a year. Um, but here's the deal. It's, you know, you make the income because of the opportunity. You have to have the right opportunity. But you make a life. The quality of life is because of the experiences in the women that you're surrounded with. And I have to say, besides the fact that I love that our company has a charitable foundation for obliterating cancer, or um, being able to stop domestic violence. Those are our two, our two um, foundations. Um, besides that, besides the go give, we believe in, it's not go get, it's what we give. Um, we believe in taking care of each other's women all over the United States and the world. So if I have a consultant in, in Minnesota, she's adopted by a director there who is not making income because of her, but is loving on her and caring about her. That's that's the spirit and the nature of how we operate, and it works, and it happens, and it's 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 truly our the spirit of how we function. So all of that, all of that, it's also the epic experiences of what you learn about how God is going to fortify you. So I'm going to close with just a couple things that I want you to consider. It's George Lombardi. That was the that was the doctor for Mother Teresa. Sorry, George Lombardi. Um, also, okay, so here it is. It is a time to rivet your attention on a spot. To rivet your attention on a spot that you want to land at at the end of your journey, quantum leap, movement forward. It's not the end all destiny. A vision is a part of the movement of what you do. So it's not that you live for the destination, it's you love your life. You love your life because you have the vision and the destination. Um, you visualize your arrival at that spot, the dream spot versus the vision spot. Like I'm going to 
I, when I earned my first Cadillac so I could get rid of the car at the home of floorboard. I envisioned it. I felt it. I smelled that car. That was part of my, <laughs> that was a part of my movement forward. And then you visualize your arrival. And when you do that, it's like you have magnetized yourself to the ways and the means that are involved and the methodology, methodology for getting there the ways and the means involved in the methodology of getting there. And then the solutions will appear and the doors will open and the answers will come to you. That was by Price Pritchard. So in conclusion, when I was in Ukraine, I was there to, to be a speaker at their um, seminar. And um, the day after the seminar, well, first of all, when I was, walking down the street in Kiev from just the hotel about a block to the to convention center. Um, all the people on the street were solemn and sad, looking down, did not have life in their eyes because they had lived for years in the captivity of communism. Um, and now they were not, but they were so indoctrinated in it. It was gray. And then I walked into the convention center and the women are standing on their chairs and they're cheering each other and new car winners are going across the stage and confetti is flying and they're singing to Beyonce, even when they speak Russian. <laughs> and it was glorious. And all I could think of is, oh my gosh, when you have a culture that is as deliberate and strong as our culture, it does infiltrate the cultures all over the world. That's what a vision will do. Um, but the last day they had a tour ride for me. And as I was sitting in the car with her and she was saying goodbye to me, she had taken me to all these beautiful churches and we've gone through museums and amazing things. And as she said goodbye, she said, Stacy, there's just one last thing that I would love to share with you. I would love to share with you if you would like to know how we win when the communist rule had fallen, when it had ended, when the wall had come down. And I said, totally enthralled. And she said, took my hands and her hands looked into my eyes and she said, what happened in the And how we knew is that the churches had been boarded up for years in the communist rule. Beautiful churches, gorgeous glass windows incredible bells and pillows had been boarded up and we had not entered into them. But in the middle of the night, the bells the churches began to pray. The bells began to pray. As soon as I got out of the car and I walked into the hotel with those words ringing in my heart, Dramatic as that was, it's the same thing with women in the US. Sometimes we've been boarded up. We don't even are in touch with our greatest gifts and skills. Sometimes we don't believe we're created for success or victory, that we're working out of the core of that. Sometimes we don't know for sure that we're not supposed to be living in the circumstance, but that we have something that could deliver us from that. But God provides things. And he created this company it's a provision but sometimes when we've been boarded up and we break through those walls if we take a positive step in a positive direction say yes to an opportunity it is an invitation to change our lives God will be waiting and he will be beside us we have Nothing to fear and nothing to be anxious for when it comes to calling on a courageous spirit to go in the direction of our dreams. Our dreams are going to be the beacon light, the lighthouse. It's what will call us when we get scared and we're unsure because Jesus lives in the uncertainty. And that's where he beckons us sometimes out of the familiar into the unknown. And heaven knows we've had a major disruption. We're not even operating in the familiar. There's nothing familiar about our lives right now, but it's an opportunity to take a chance to ask him for direction and vision 
and that there's something in front of us that's going to be far greater and bigger and more magnificent, the glorious rendition of you that we created you to be. So thank you guys for spending time with me. I love you even if I don't know you. <laughs> and hopefully I will see you soon.